All right, I see attendees are filtering into the webinar room. Uh, we're just gonna hang tight for a second as people kind of enter from the waiting room into the main webinar space. So just give everyone a few minutes to, to join, the, join the webinar. All right, so we will go ahead and get started. And if we have any latecomers, that's fine too. Uh, so welcome to our James Beard Foundation Industry Support Webinar, What the 2020 Election Means for Food Policy. I'm Ashley Koziak. I'm an Impact Program Manager here at the James Beard Foundation. And I'm gonna be kind of moderating, facilitating this conversation that we're going to have today. So I'll cover a couple things that are general to all of our industry support webinars. Um, so things that will not be new for anyone who's joined us before. This webinar is being recorded. By next week, the recording will be available on the past webinars and events page on openforgood.com. So if you wanna share this webinar, if you have to hop off at any time um, and need to miss the end, all of that will be available by next week. Uh, so we'll save the questions for the end as time allows. We have so much to get through, but we will try to address questions that come in as best we're able to. But we have so much to cover in this webinar. Um, so we'll try to get to your questions at the end. If you do have questions, you can write in your questions at any time using the webinar toolbar. It looks like just like a little message icon with a question mark in it. You're free to submit your questions that way. And if you're having technical difficulties, you can message us using the webinar toolbar as well, and we'll do what we can to help troubleshoot. My colleague, Megan, is here. here. She can't see her, but she is here with me and here with us as well, and one of us will try to help troubleshoot, again, as best we're able to. Um, so hopefully everyone can see and hear just fine. Uh, so I'm gonna start now by introducing the, the webinar panels that we have today. We're really excited to have everyone here. Uh, so we, we are joined by Ian Garrison, who is the Deputy Chief of Staff and Legislative Director for the Office of Representative Marsha Fudge from Ohio's 11th District. We're also joined by Jacqueline Schneider, uh, Deputy Staff Director, U.S. Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition and Forestry, and also Trisha Griffin, partner at NVG. And so the topic of this webinar is what the 2020 election means for food policy. There's so much in that. We're actually gonna start by talking a little bit because this has been a topic of a lot of conversation lately um, on, the, on the package that's currently being discussed in Washington DC right now. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about that uh, before we kind of talk more about broadly like committees going forward and new administration and all those really exciting things as well. So Congress is still trying to work out a package to deal with the economic crisis wrought by the coronavirus pandemic. That's still in the works. There has been a stalemate since the last deal in April. This week, we've learned of a new conversation, conversations that are coming together by a small group of senators and Leader McConnell. Um, and, and Leader McConnell also uh, released his proposal. So there are several different um, ideas, packages out there floating around right now. Um, so Jacqueline, this one is for you. From your per preview in the Senate, how do you think these negotiations are going? Uh, I think the good news is the negotiations are going. Uh, they were stalled for um, an extended period of time here, and I think uh, we we were um, continuing to press for action on a COVID package, knowing that there's a lot of need out there across the board uh, in the food and nutrition space, um, but also across the economy more broadly. So there's been a big push going on um, for months now to try and get another COVID package rolling. and. Um, haven't been successful yet, but um, but it's good that there's conversations going now. There's bipartisan conversations, um, indication 
from both the House and the Senate that um, that there's some support for these conversations continuing and the framework that the bipartisan group released. Um, there is uh, $26 billion in the framework for a combination of ag and nutrition. Um, details, I think, are still coming together. Um, but I do think that the senators are all meeting on a regular basis and the Senate Ag Committee continues to have conversations um, both with the senators that are involved and the broader Democratic uh, caucus as a whole and some of the Republican members as well. Uh, I think we are cautiously optimistic. I think uh, anything that we're looking at is probably going to be less robust than some of us might have hoped. Um, but anything that begins to provide some assistance that's desperately needed right now uh, is a good step forward. Um, so I think we're uh, hopeful and watching and engaging as much as we can and trying to um, figure out how to put together a good package that would um, especially support this sector, uh, but but the economy as a whole. Yay. So you you have the House perspective on this. In the last House bill, Heroes 2.0 or Heroes 2, yeah. there were a number of provisions to support the food and nutrition industry, the restaurant community. It was a really, um, really encompassing bill. What are you pushing for in the final package right now? So, yeah, so we were really happy where, where we landed. We, we, we voted on the updated Heroes Act or Heroes 2.0 back in early October. Um, a lot of the nutrition provisions were a carryover from the first HEROES Act from sort of earlier in the pandemic. The biggest thing from that was the 15% boost in SNAP benefits. I think that's kind of collectively been our, our, our caucus's, you know, big priority on the, in the nutrition space. Um, so that is something that, you know, obviously we would like to see in a future COVID package. Again, kind of echoing what Jacqueline said, not necessarily knowing what what nutrition pieces are already sort of being discussed. I think that's kind of top of our list. And then also there's emergency relief for school districts that have been hard hit um, uh, by the pandemic for school, for school meal service. Um, that's another area where we would really like to provide some relief. I know for us, you know, our, our school nutrition directors are, are hurting and have seen decreases in school meal participation. Um, some of the other uh, key provisions that were in there, there was additional money for, for food banks to store and distribute food. Um, there were some allowances in there for low-income uh, college students to access SNAP, um, even, uh, well, due to uh, closes in, in their, I'm sorry, hold on. Hey, Imani, can you not print? I'm sorry, I'm in the office, so, <laughs> so, so bear, so, so bear, bear with me. Um, so there were some allowances in there for, for college students who were impacted by campus closures and unable to meet certain SNAP work study requirements. Um, there was some additional money in there for SNAP, additional funding in there for, for WIC, um, some flexibilities for um, households on Indian reservations, nutrition assistance for the territories. There was some additional money in there for senior nutrition assistance. Um, and then I know we're going to talk about the Restaurants Act. Um, we were really happy to see the Restaurants Act in there. That's a $120 billion uh, grant for, for the hardest hit independent restaurants. Um, outside of nutrition, I know that this group is obviously interested in some additional investments in the Paycheck Protection Program that was also in there. Um, I know that that's part of the ongoing conversations that Jacqueline was referring to. So. Um, for them, for our part, again, I think we're we're mostly interested in the Restaurants Act, obviously moving forward, PPP um, increases in flexibility, the SNAP boost, and then the relief for school nutrition directors. So it's probably top of top of the list for my boss. Trisha, so you know, moving from from you know, kind of the broader Heroes 2.0 bill, narrowing in on restaurants. So restaurants was in that Heroes 2.0. Um, assuming COVID relief does happen before the end of this year, uh, what what do you think are the chances for the Restaurants Act, which would provide 120 billion in grant programs to independent bars and restaurants? to help ensure that many of these businesses can remain open. Uh, it's something that, you know, the, the Beard Foundation with, uh, you know, the IRC, Independent Restaurant Coalition, um, have really been pushing for, um, and there's been support from, um, you know, various organizations as well. What do you think the chances are of some semblance of that? 
Well, it is um, a bit above my pay grade to make an actual calculation at this point about that. But I, I want to say a couple of things about the effort, uh, the advocacy effort, the campaign around the Restaurant Act. It has been um, one of the most impressive industry efforts I have seen to date, um, where you have a situation where there wasn't an, an actual, you know, robust, organized coalition that was managed and run to target a piece of policy. And so um, not only did it show up in the HEROES Act, um, it, it is also has incredible bipartisan support on the Senate side, which again is un, is really very unusual in these times. And so the work that has been done, um, and it, it comes from the restaurant owners and workers who have really taken a huge role in the advocacy, um, you know, responsibility on this work. And so I want to say it's been in, amazing to watch. Um, with that said, I think you know uh, I want to really my I want to be clear that. What is happening around the debate debate around COVID has 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 less to do as we get closer to the end of this year about what is what should be in it and what should be prioritized um, than it does about kind of political dynamics and majority control and other big deals like the change in administration, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, you know, I it is not over. The debate is is ongoing. The effort needs to continue in terms of restaurants and and allies and supporters of restaurants showing up and 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 be and putting pressure on um, you know the right people. But the the actual package is being held hostage in some ways. And you know one factor that hasn't moved a lot during this entire process has been the you know the republican leadership in the senate and so what what needs to continue to happen is is that pressure and that information and sharing of um of need um which i think has been done in a brilliant way i want to make sure that the community knows that it isn't as a because of a lack of incredible work um it's about other things and very few people making decisions about some really important things you know money and and, and emergency resources that need to go out to the country so um, I'm feeling, you know, uh, I, I have to stay optimistic um, because we cannot stop, whether it's about right now in December, which it is, I know we are in a dire situation and we need those rest, that, the resources of restaurants now, but this is not the end of the conversation around emergency and stimulus resources. And so in no way, shape or form can we stop this conversation, stop the advocacy effort. Um, but I feel like a, um, you know, the deal is is being done at the highest of levels and it is about what can be accomplished in the next 10 days or so um and then what can we what do we need to invest in and, and look forward to in the future so not over um but it's it's a it's an upward battle um but the efforts even in this last week have been tremendous um so uh keep it up and uh, we'll keep it up here in washington dc Thank you. And I will share this plug again at the end of the webinar, but the James Beard Foundation has sent, uh, you know, our board of trustees have sent a letter to, to leadership calling on the importance of the Restaurants Act. And I also want to highlight that right now, our friends at the Independent Restaurant Coalition have a sign-on letter going that is also going to leadership. Uh, please, you know, if you're if you're interested in that, which I think most of the people on this call are, you can go to Save Restaurants dot com to sign on to that letter and again i'll share that at the end of the webinar as well but save restaurants.com all right so uh, we're going to stay on this for just a couple more questions um so jacqueline i'm going to go back to you and yang I'll, I'll send this question to you after jacqueline responds are members of congress congress thinking about what the winter months ahead mean for restaurants many of which you know with cases spiking with people trying to move outdoor dining when they can, um, thinking about you know, what the winter is gonna mean for the restaurant industry. Uh, absolutely, uh, obviously you, your advocacy has made um, folks very aware of the fact that um, the restaurant industry is one of the, the critical industries that is struggling. Um, I'll tell you personally, my brother works in a restaurant and uh, he's disappointed to be at home and not, uh, not in the restaurant right now uh, because of some of the restrictions in my home state. Um, and uh, certainly we would love for us to be in a position where restaurants are open again and uh, you all can have us sitting in your dining rooms. Um, but until that's the case, we need to figure out a way to try and keep restaurants afloat. Uh, and I think the co-sponsorship of the Restaurant Act um, is a key example of how many members of Congress are aware of some of the challenges and the need for support. Uh, I think, as Tricia mentioned, this, this is, um, this is the beginning of the conversation, not the end with the package that's being considered right now. Um, I think we are largely looking at this as a patch 
Um, so I'm not sure where uh, the prospects are going to end up being for some of that direct support, um, but we are thinking about it in a multi-pronged approach. Um, and that goes for some of the interactions with um, restaurants and um, in release for supply chain. Um, my boss had a bill uh, on supply chain that would have supplemented some of the work that USDA was doing and FEMA was doing and involved the restaurant industry more. I think we um, you know, see some potential opportunity to broaden the type of assistance and the way that some of the assistance has been done in the past on supply chain issues that would involve um, restaurants more in the feeding operations as well. Um, we are looking at every angle we can to try and provide some temporary short-term assistance um, and and then continue to look going forward, uh, even post this package, if there's additional opportunities there. Um, so I do think that there's some attention and the attention has certainly been growing and kudos to all of you for the work you've been doing to elevate uh, the impacts of COVID on the restaurant industry. Um, I just don't know the scope and, and spectrum of how large this package is going to end up being uh, and whether or not there will be aid included in the short term, but I do think that there's um, uh, definitely more of an awareness than there was at the beginning of the crisis on, on some of the impacts that you all are seeing. Unmute, so I'm gonna unmute myself. Um, <laughs> If you were lip reading, you know what I'm going to say. Uh, so I'm going to segue that question to Yang with the additional kind of add-on. Um, you know, there's some extreme hardship for the restaurant right now. How do we keep this at the forefront of policymakers' minds? I mean, I, I think the work that you guys are already doing. You know, uh, I think you know Tricia mentioned the letters that have been circulating. We've been getting tons of outreach, um, both locally and nationally, from stakeholders all over the country that are interested in seeing the Restaurants Act get across the finish line. And I will tell you that anytime any of those letters, any of those sign on letters comes across my desk, you know, my boss wants to make sure that she's signed on. Um, you know, it, it, it's obviously at the forefront of our minds here in the house, given that it was already in our, in our Heroes Act. Um, and I think that members here understand, I mean, just the, just the fact that we're having COVID talks right now. I think when I signed on to do this webinar, you know, we, it was still sort of unclear as to whether or not we were gonna get back to the negotiating table. And so, so much has changed um, even in such a short amount of time. So I think, I think again, to, to what Jacqueline, to Jacqueline's point, we absolutely understand that restaurants are still hurting. It's getting colder. What does this mean? Um, you know, for, for restaurants uh, in particular. And we actually had a teletown hall a couple of months ago uh, dedicated to small businesses. And we partnered with the SBA who was on the call with my boss, uh, taking questions from small businesses and restaurants in the district. And so we, we wanted to use that one as an opportunity for restaurants to be able to ask questions of, of the Congresswoman, but also be able to ask SBA about, you know, all of the, the various, um, uh, sort of hoops you sort of have to go through as far as applying for some of these various loans and kind of understanding some some of those aspects that are kind of beyond um, you know my boss's um, general knowledge on, on on small business loans so I so I think ultimately we we we, we care we're, we're excited to see so much movement happening uh, on the next COVID package and I think again the work that you guys are all doing the fact that we're hearing from you guys um, I, I think is is helping to to raise the profile of the needs of, of of restaurants as we as we get into the winter. Great, thank you. Uh, and so now, if if anyone has anything left to chime in about the the Restaurants Act or the stimulus package, I think we're going to change gears a little bit to talk a little bit more about the transition of various you know committees and how all these other things are going to work. Uh, so, Jacqueline, there will be a leadership transition with Chairman Roberts retiring. What do you think this means for, for your committee, which, you know, to kind of reiterate to everyone, um, you know, Deputy Staff Director, U.S. Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry, so a lot of food-related things. Um, so what does this transition mean for your committee? And looking ahead, what do you expect on the agenda for the Senate Agriculture Committee next year? 
so I think we're a little bit in limbo right now. Um, Senator Roberts is retiring. We had our last hearing yesterday, um, and Senator Bozeman is next in line for uh, the lead Republican slot, uh, and we anticipate that he will be uh, taking over for Senator Roberts in that lead Republican slot. And I say lead Republican slot because we don't know whether to call him ranking member or chair. Uh, obviously, uh, working for Senator Stabenow, we hope that she is chair and that we're working with Senator Bozeman in a ranking member capacity, um, but, uh, but he will be our partner either way. Uh, Senator Bozeman is from Arkansas. Uh, he does have a history in the um, nutrition space as one of the co-chairs of the Senate Hunger Caucus. Um, but he also has a lot of ag interests down in Arkansas. Uh, so I think that the agenda um, could be partially determined by who's holding the gavel. Uh, I know my boss um, is very committed to reauthorizing the child nutrition programs uh, that have been on hold. We've been working on many different child nutrition reauthorization bills over the past few years, none of which have uh, gotten across the finish line, unfortunately. So that's certainly something that I think uh, Senator Stabenow as chair would be interested in pursuing, uh, as well as continued uh, efforts to look at the supply chain and COVID relief. I think this will be an ongoing conversation throughout next year and what the needs are uh, in nutrition and anti-hunger, as well as um, for agriculture and some of the supply chain disruptions that we've seen. Uh, Senator Bozeman, we're not entirely sure what his agenda will look like. Uh, he has had a history of working on some child nutrition efforts uh, on some of the summer meals programs in other areas. So certainly possible he could be interested in some of those components, um, but he will also likely want to put his imprimatur on the committee related to ag. Uh, so I would anticipate just the order and the structure of priorities might be a bit different, whether he's ranking member or chair. Um, but Senator Stabenow and Senator Bozeman do have a good working relationship. Uh, so I'd anticipate for many of you who may have watched the Senate Ag Committee in recent years, uh, Senator Stabenow and Senator Roberts were good friends and got along very well uh, and had a very good working relationship. I think we anticipate that that would continue with Senator Bozeman as well, um, regardless of who is uh, the chair or ranking. Um, but the agenda just might look a little bit different and the timing might be different as well. Uh, Senator Bozeman being new to that seat uh, will have to staff up and, and develop his policy agenda, um, whereas uh, we do have a, a full staff and um, some history with Senator Sabanow, so we might be able to get started on whatever our agenda is a bit quicker. And Yang, there was a big change at the top of the House Agriculture Committee as well, which your boss serves on um, and has legislation, uh, legislative jurisdiction over issues, including, you know, things that are really important to people on this call, agriculture, food, rural development, those really important issues. Um, what do you think that this change means for the priorities of the committee um, in the House? So I, I think, you know, sort of similar to the Senate, uh, things are a little unclear. We're actually uh, it's 2.24, we just resume, resumed caucus votes at uh, 2.15, so the, the chair of the Ag Committee will be determined, you know, in the next, you know, probably hour or so. Uh, we, we have uh, Congressman Jim Costa from California and Congressman David Scott uh, from Georgia that are both vying for, for the top slot. Um, both of them have, have pledged to prioritize nutrition and addressing hunger issues, um, as well as the needs of rural and urban communities alike. I mean, Jim Costa is coming from a specialty crop state and uh, David Scott has had a history of um, putting a lot of support behind 1890 land grant uh, universities. So it's unclear, again, you know, kind of what their priorities will be. Again, they've, they've they both also pledged to continue Chairman Peterson's legacy of bipartisanship and future farm bills. So I think we anticipate that 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 will that that work will will continue. Um, but I imagine that whoever gets the slot will will likely want to one sit down again. I think staffing, you know, figuring out you know staffing issues within the committee, but then also working with the new administration and and collaborating on you know what those priorities will look like and what are the needs. What are the challenges? Um, where are the gaps? What are some of the things that need to be addressed perhaps in the next farm bill? All right, so farm bill and you know other really important things. Trisha, as an advocate, what do you, these changes mean for, for you and the work that, that you do and you help chefs do? Well, first of all, I'm thrilled that 
<laughs> that there's a change in leadership. Um, and not because I don't have, you know, a lot of respect for Chairman Roberts as, as I did for the chairman on the House side, but I, um, Chairman Peterson, but I do believe um, those folks were in those positions for a very long time. Um, and anytime there's change in Washington, DC, um, those of us that work both, I think, on the Hill and the administration or outside see it as an opportunity. It's an opportunity to do something different, to breathe fresh air into um, a set of issues and policies and the way that a committee is managed and the culture of that committee. Um, now that can go in a way that you don't necessarily want, but I do think it's always an opportunity for um, forward thinking um, and for, you know, just again, looking at the, the incredible um, vast array of issues that that committee has jurisdiction over. Um, in some ways it won't change that much, but I do think it's important to note, especially on the House side, um, if, if it should be, you know, uh, Chairman Scott or Costa having a, a member of color in that in that role, um, while they're not going to be able to tackle and challenge all the diversity issues um, that the ag agriculture and food system are tackling, um, or at, even at USDA, I do think that there, someone with a new lens or just a different perspective is, is again, refreshing and interesting. Um, and I even think with, you know, um, you know, should it be ranking member Bozeman or chairman Bozeman, um, you know, unlike chairman Roberts, who actually designed some of the programs that are quite controversial in the farm bills, um, he is, he is, he is a, a slightly different generation. And so it's again, an opportunity um, to figure out how we, we look at the priorities and the, and of, of the committee and how they get, um, you know, worked on and maybe some more forward thinking um, uh, ideas and policies will be considered with new leadership. So I'm thrilled about it. I'm excited about it on both sides. Um, and I look forward to, you know, building the same kind of relationships and supporting the bipartisan support that these committees have have, for the most part, been able to kind of maintain when they're making big decisions um, like around the farm bill, which is is it's is fast and furious coming down the pike. Trisha, I'm going to stay with you for one for one question, um, just to make sure that we all all of us on the webinar and all the attendees have the same grounding of information. The farm bill is really important, and I feel like we talk about the farm bill a lot. Could you share with everyone why the farm bill is so important and you know one of the most important pieces of food policy that we talk about? Because I think some people think, oh, farm, it's about like soy, but it's about so much more than that. Could you talk a little bit about that? I, well, the fact that you're asking me that question in front of Yang and Jacqueline is such a setup for failure. But because I have done some, I'm going to go to them next. Ones <laughs> for the chef committee. Well, very quickly, um, the farm bill um, has, you know, covers everything from food access and food insecurity to crop subsidies, forestry, um, environmental issues, conservation. It, it, it is accountable to so many different um, uh, aspects of rural America, agriculture, health and well-being. And so it is what I see as what I'd like to call is the food bill. It's the it's the biggest piece of policy where you can have the most influence on food policy at the federal level. And so, um, you know, I, for some years now, I've been trying to bring along as many unusual suspects uh, to participate in this incredible conversation and policy development. And Jacqueline knows because I show up at her door and Yang too, but um, I'm a little bit longer with the poor Jacqueline, um, with people who are learning about the bill and want to help influence and, and have conversations about it. So it really is, it is something everybody should understand. Everybody should be um, uh, uh, pay attention to um, and 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 be a part of because, um, like I said, it is the it is the greatest opportunity to change food policy um, in Washington D.C. Jacqueline Yang, I think she did an okay job, but I'm gonna did a great job explaining that, Trisha. I was, I'm still gonna go to you two now. Um, you know, the Farm Bill is it's um, set to be reauthorized in 2023. It's it's so important. It's a food bill. It includes everything. Um, we have heard calls for an earlier farm bill, so before 2023. Uh, do, does this idea have merit, and what would it take to do an earlier farm bill? And Jacqueline, I'm going to start with you on that question. Uh, earlier farm bill gives me heart palpitations to think about that. Um, so uh, I, I think Trisha did a really great job um, talking about the reason that uh, everyone should care about the Farm Bill. Uh, it really does touch on a whole variety of different things across programs. 
um, that is more than just uh, traditional, you know, corn and soybean. Uh, it really is about the food and, and more so every year, uh, every year that we go by every farm bill that we write um, talks a little bit more about uh, the nuances of, of grander food policy. Uh, it's also the largest investment in public lands conservation in the federal government. Uh, so there's a lot of things to care about in the farm bill and uh, love when Trisha brings in new people to get excited about the farm bill and be a part of the farm bill coalition. So, um, uh, so it, it is um, a daunting prospect to do a farm bill early. Um, and for exactly the reason that it is such a comprehensive package, um, does it, the idea have merit? Uh, uh, certainly, there's reasons to um, to reevaluate farm programs um, when when need arises. Uh, but I would say a farm bill process is usually about two years worth of work. Uh, so for, for the uh, 2023 farm bill, uh, we would start having hearings early in 2022 uh, in the Senate. Our history is to uh, have field hearings in both the ranking member and chair's home states and then begin the process in Washington. Uh, and it is um, usually a bill that is uh, about this thick and um, you know somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 pages. Uh, so it is, it is a substantial amount of work. And to a certain degree, you also want uh, a substantial amount of time for staff and members to be talking to folks on the ground, um, folks like uh, all of you and other people who have a vested interest in what that farm policy looks like to make sure that we get it right. Um, so I will say there there will be um, a little bit of uh, startup time with the administration, taking a look at changes that need to be made from um, what the current administration did. And, and we regularly engage with USDA on a lot of the policy options and things that might need to be changed for implementation. And we will still have ongoing COVID relief efforts into next year. Um, so that does complicate the idea of doing a farm bill early. Um, not unprecedented, not unheard of, um, but I will put one other thing in the uh, conversation related to the early farm bill. So. The 2018 Farm Bill uh, was actually signed into law in December of 2018. So um, normally farm bills are a five-year cycle. Uh, and so a 2023 Farm Bill is already uh, short on time because the Farm Bill was signed into law at the very end of 2018. So just something else to keep in mind in terms of the timeline. Yang, um, what do you yeah. think of an earlier farm bill? And also, like, why why is the farm bill important to to your offices as well? I mean, for all the all the reasons that both Jacqueline and and, and Trisha, you know, art, articulated. I, to to be honest, as far as timeline, it's so hard to say here because I think folks are genuinely anxious. I think when you start talking about farm bills. Um, I think folks are anxious. We're in the middle of a pandemic and there's so many ideas floating around here in, in the house um, around food policy that I that I think folks are anxious to, to get some of that stuff to the floor. And typically we don't really do any of that stuff outside of the farm bill. Um, I will say that because we have a new chairman coming in, um, that timeline is still is also unclear for, for that reason. Um, you know, Jacqueline, you guys have the benefit of, of, you know, kind of knowing how you guys have done things in the past. Like, we don't know what our new chairman is going to want to do as far as, as far as when conversations will start, what hearings will look like, you know, um, you know, it just kind of remains to be seen. But, but again, I think people are anxious. Um, there's lots of pandemic related ideas across the broader agriculture uh, sector that we'll likely start seeing more of um, next Congress. So, so I think it's to to be continued. So another uh, piece of legislation that it tends to be really important and close to a lot of chef and culinary professionals' heart is childhood nutrition and childhood nutrition reauthorization. Jacqueline, could you talk a little bit first for, for explain for anyone who doesn't know what childhood child nutrition reauthorization is? Um, and it was supposed to be reauthorized a couple of Congresses ago. Do you think there's still a possibility that it could happen in the near future? Oh, Jacqueline, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, uh, 
Hope Springs Eternal, uh, the uh, Child Nutrition Reauthorization, um, is a an omnibus bill, which is what we refer to both the Farm Bill, Child Nutrition. Um, some of the bills that we do in the Ag Committee tend to be bills that put together policy that cross a couple different programmatic areas. So the Child Nutrition Reauthorization um, reauthorizes programs related to uh, school breakfast, school lunch, after school meals, uh, summer meals programs, the WIC program and the child and adult care food program, which covers uh, a lot of the feeding uh, that, it, that occurs in child care settings and adult care settings. Uh, so those are the primary programs um, that are a part of the child nutrition reauthorization. And then some really important smaller ones like farm to school programs and some of the nutrition education. Um, so it is a, a comprehensive bill in the nutrition space. Uh, it was set to originally be authorized, reauthorized in 2015. Uh, we worked towards a child nutrition reauthorization in 2015 uh, that did not get across the finish line. Uh, we tried to restart that effort uh, at the beginning of 2019 and had actually made a significant amount of progress. And I think we were uh, getting fairly close to a place where we might have been able to advance something in 2020. And then COVID hit. Uh, which put child nutrition on hold again. And um, unfortunately, the crisis did not resolve itself as quickly as I think some might have hoped when we might have had the opportunity to restart the process. Uh, so um, child nutrition did not get done this year uh, either. But I think that uh, after 10 years since the last reauthorization, there's a lot of interest um, amongst the Senate on a bipartisan level in trying to address child nutrition in the near term. Um, I mentioned earlier that Senator Bozeman does have a history here. So regardless of whether it's Senator Stabenow or Senator Bozeman, I think there will be a conversation about what we should do on child nutrition programs. Uh, he actually introduced a bill related to the summer meals program, which is an area where we certainly had difficulty with reaching children who normally eat meals during the school year um, and are uh, not accessing those are not accessing those meals during the summer. And that's uh, that's an issue that's especially problematic. And some rural communities that I know um, exist in Arkansas specifically. So Senator Bozeman does have an interest in a variety of different programs within the child nutrition space. So uh, I'm hopeful that whether it's Senator Stabenow or Senator Bozeman, um, we can restart those conversations. And um, I will say uh, just in the context of the timelines with Farm Bill as well, um, you know, on the Senate side, the Agriculture Committee is responsible for both Farm Bill and child nutrition programs uh, in the House. Um, the Education and Labor uh, Committee is actually the committee that um, handles child nutrition programs, whereas SNAP and some of the other farm bill programs are within the House Ag Committee. Um, Yang has the pleasure of uh, having her boss on both committees, so she's had a role uh, on both sides, uh, even though one committee doesn't handle it like ours, but it does complicate a little bit um, the interaction between farm bill timeline and child nutrition timeline. So if we are working on child nutrition um, and we will also have nominations, uh, since we have a new administration coming in, the Senate Agriculture Committee will be managing all the nominations for the Department of Agriculture. Uh, that does give us a, a hefty workload, uh, at least in, in the 2021 time period. Tricia, you talked about, you know, bringing chefs and, and other people in to visit, you know, Jacqueline and Yang and getting their take on the farm bill. What role can the folks who are, you know, on, on this webinar right now, what can they do to, you know, influence policy ideas and legislation? Well, I mean, it, it, as, as, it, as it relates to chefs, um, they, my experience with chef community um, and folks in the restaurant world, they are some of the best, if not best advocates um, that I have worked with in my, in my life. I have a lot of wonderful people I work with, but both because of their temperament and their their desire to get things done, um, but they also sit in this really important role, right? They are rest, they're business owners, they're employers, they have an understanding of the food system from you know production to consumer. Um, they often have this passion for their community um, as it relates to, you know, hunger or immigration issues. And so, you know, they come with just, you know, they come already set up with an incredible amount of knowledge and information. Um, and so the, the reason that can happen is, you know, at home, in the state, building relationships, continuing to put a face um, and a story behind why these policies are important, not just something in theory. Um, showing up to Washington, D.C., inviting, you know, Jacqueline and Yang to come and, and, and have these conversations with them, um, you know, and so, you know, it's it's about 
you know, if it's a one issue or a range of issues, it's, it's getting focused, it's getting educated, it's, it's in listening folks like myself to help you kind of, you know, navigate that. But um, I think we are at a moment in time where, especially this community, the chef community, is they're known advocates now and um, and they come, you know, uh, with a lot of information, a wealth of information that is already built into who they are. Um, and so, you know, whether it's around child nutrition reauthorization or it's about, you know, the farm bill, um, doing it alone and in partnership with your allies and stakeholders, um, whether they're farmers or food insecurity folks, um, you know, you, 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 you play a very important role in these conversations and will continue to moving forward. And then this next question is for both Yang and Jacqueline. And Yang, I'm going to send it to you first. Why why is it so important for um, you know members of Congress to hear from their constituents? Well, I mean, I think I think the 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 answer is probably probably obvious. You know, my my boss has been saying a lot actually recently, but you know, she says this often, which is that you know when she knows more, when she has more knowledge about a situation on the ground. And she makes better policy decisions here in Washington, D.C. So we're always encouraging our local stakeholders to stay in touch with us. Um, we do a lot of proactive outreach. We have a regular meeting with our anti-hunger advocates um, in the Cleveland, Akron area, where we sort of share some of the ideas um, that they're working through, some public-private partnerships. We talk about what's happening here in Washington. You know, they tell me all the things that, you know, we need to get done here in Washington that, that will, you know, help them through this pandemic and, and beyond. And so, you know, uh, it's 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 the core of, of what we do. You know, she's a representative and, and and you know, we we truly want to represent the interests of of our of our stakeholders back home in the district. One one thing in particular that that I think would be of interest to this particular audience is that earlier this year uh, there was money provided through the Older Americans Act uh, in the CARES Act, and I think about half of that money is for nutrition assistance for seniors. Our Ohio Department of Aging leveraged those dollars that they received. Uh, from the CARES Act and created a restaurant meals program. Kind of new, the funding is is typically used for programs like Meals on Wheels. And so working with restaurants across the state to prepare and deliver meals to, to seniors, you know, that that's you know a, a good example of a public-private partnership that's ongoing in this in this pandemic. And a lot of that was born out of conversations we were having with our local with our local um, stakeholders. So it's very valuable. Um, you know, we, we have ideas, we wanna hear the ideas of, of those on, on the ground. And again, it just makes for better policy making here when we know, you know, what, what the needs are of, of those that are gonna be mostly impacted. And Jacqueline, what do you, what do you think about the, you know, hearing from constituents? Um, so it's it is our job to be responsive to constituents and um we are we are uh, not just here to do the things that we think would be really cool um but to do the things that are most beneficial to um to average americans businesses um, folks on the ground that are actually directly impacted by programs and i think uh, one of the things that my boss uh makes um a top priority for her is uh, thinking about the way real people are affected on a daily basis. Uh, we don't make policy in a vacuum. It's about what happens for people back in her home state in, Mich in Michigan and throughout the country. Uh, so hearing directly from you all actually not only helps us to, to inform the boss and make sure that she's making good decisions in that way, um, but also learn about things that are happening that uh, we might not see because we're here. Uh, we may not um, know the nuance of how a specific poly policy is affecting someone and knowing that there is a problem, a challenge, something that could be corrected, uh, that, that helps us to make better policy. So um, it is invaluable and we couldn't do this job without you. So um, please do continue to reach out and, um, and the advocacy uh, for, for all of the members, we are um, working for elected officials that uh, have to go back to their hometowns and their home states and make the case that they are good representatives all the time. So when you are advocating and trying to convince someone that something is a priority or should be that they might not be considering, um, you you are using your voice to try and 
affect change and make sure that you're holding those elected officials accountable. So, um, you know, we've always found the restaurant industry and um, many of the folks that uh, participate in food policy to be um, tremendously effective in getting to members, to talking talking about the business impacts, talking about the impacts on feeding communities. Uh, so, um, so I do think that you all sit in a unique place to um, reach members on multiple different levels on both sides of the aisle. So very important. Great. And Tricia, I'm gonna before we kind of move move more into um, about about the you know the, the follow up of the election, what it means for food and agriculture, which we're kind of talking about right now. Only one question that came in that I just want to touch on quickly. So if I have a really great great idea for policy at the national level, um, is it important for me to talk to my specific congressman, woman, senator? Or can I can I go visit E Yang and say, E Yang, I don't live in Ohio, but I've got this great idea. How does that work? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, so the way that legislation gets developed and then moves through a process, hopefully to success, is that it has to have original sponsors and support and you have to develop the policy through the, you know, the process that is set up here at the federal level. Um, it is smart to both to first talk to um, your member or members of Congress to see if there's an interest um, and if they are willing to be helpful in navigating that process, if you don't have a, you know, some a, a, a advocate or a lobby ally to help you navigate that. Um, but then it's important to obviously um, identify and hopefully with your friendly member of Congress, whether it's on the House or Senate side, members of, of the committees of jurisdiction. So it's both, you know, finding that really hardcore champion who's going to be that workhorse for you. Um, but then it also is, is important to identify those people who are on the committees that make decisions over the policies in which your policy will land at some point um, to be involved in that process at well as well. Sometimes that's a, it's an immediate hit. You have a member that's on the right committee and, and they're an ally and they're a friend and they're willing to work with you. Sometimes it takes some some time to build relationships through your existing member, um, but it it you know eventually has to be embraced and and supported by members of Congress on the committees of jurisdiction. So it's been a month since the election. What does I mean? This is the name of of the panel. We've talked about so many things because you know future administration and committees and elections have so many implications, um, but. What does the 2020 election mean for the future of food, agriculture, and policies in the U.S.? It's a really broad question, um, but I feel like there's, we've already touched on some of it. There's been changes in committee leadership, um, which, you know, changes up the priorities. Uh, you know, is there is there anything that's top of mind for, for you all, but specifically Jacqueline and Yang, and in terms of, you know, what the next couple of years might look like? Where's your crystal balls out? Be better than the last four. How about how about that? Um, you know, I, I think you know, I, I think the future is bright. There's so much that's unclear, but I think what is clear is that you know we're 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 looking at an administration that that is supportive of the nutrition programs. You know, the, I think we spent the better part of the first session of of this current Congress really um, fighting to protect the nutrition program. So. Uh, hopefully, um, we, we're we're moving to the other side of things um, now on the, on the nutrition front. But you know, ultimately, I think just for broader agriculture, I think it means I think it means good things. Um, but it's it's still unclear like the specifics within that. But um, you know, my boss is really hopeful. Um, she gets really excited when 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 talking about um, you know just just the future even here um, in the house. And so we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, I, I think uh, to echo Yang, I think the future is bright. Uh, you see big smiles on our faces when we think about this. Um, you know, we have spent the last four years largely fighting to try and maintain uh, access and eligibility for um, nutrition programs across the board. Uh, and uh, on the agriculture side, um, I think that there were certainly some uh, programmatic decisions that were more targeted to certain groups of producers than others. And I think mm -hmm. one of the things that uh, I know my boss is uh, a, a big advocate for and something that we've pushed this administration on and, and are more hopeful about the next uh, administration 
is that there will be a broader look at uh, the diversity of agriculture, um, a, a better attention to all types of crops and different type of cropping systems and different types of ways to connect farmers to families, um, looking at some uh, historical issues about bringing more diversity into agriculture and some challenges there, uh, and just looking holistically about the relationship between food and ag and the economy and what it can do to lift people up as opposed to um, trying to figure out how we reduce the spending there, uh, especially in a time like right now when we are in a crisis situation. Um, Food brings people together in so many ways and is so important to um, rebuilding uh, the, the economy and the ability for people to get back on their feet. Uh, so I think that this administration will, will take a new look at that. And I'm excited to hear a bit more when we do have uh, a secretary and have the ability to get into some of the specific policy priorities. But I think that if you look at the, um, the Biden-Harris priorities across the board, you can see some themes that fit pretty neatly into an agriculture, nutrition, and food space as well in terms of the economy, social justice, the role of, um, of trying to bring food policy together with, uh, with nutrition and good health. Um, you know, as we're looking at COVID relief efforts, um, you know, we, we know that nutrition is a key component to making bodies healthy and some of the health impacts that have affected the, um, the outcomes that we've seen from, from COVID infection. So, um, so there's certainly a lot of things that you can see, even in the broad themes of the Biden-Harris administration that, um, that I think you'll see reflected down into USDA. But, um, but this is the, this is the moment to quote a little bit of what Tricia said about the changeover in committee leadership. Uh, this is an exciting time because, um, you know, we, we sort of have the ability to, to build anew and um, to work with the new administration on what those priorities are going to be and shape, uh, shape the future. So um, I'm very excited. I know my boss is excited. Uh, we have lots of big smiles about the possibilities. Right. I have um, two questions that we're going to go to try to get to in these last seven minutes from the attendees. Um, we have several questions from attendees, but we try to layer those in there before we get to any closing or final thoughts. Um, one is, uh, it's about, from President-elect Biden um, during the campaign, we heard a lot about um, being responsive to climate change and putting more of a focus on responding to climate change. Um, do you think we should expect to see that perspective, the climate change perspective, impacting food system policies, um, you know, supply chains, restaurants? How do you think climate will will fit into that? I'll open it up to whoever thinks they might be able to have, have a response. <laughs> okay, um, I'm happy to jump in on that one. Um, so I do think uh, both in Congress and um, in the administration, you'll see a big focus on climate change uh, and agriculture in the food system has a tremendous role in that. Um, and I think that we've actually seen some really positive steps towards bipartisanship on the climate issue uh, that that hasn't been the case um, in uh, in the past necessarily. Uh, but uh, my boss has a, a, a bill that she has joined Senator Braun on that has a good bipartisan support, the Growing Climate Solutions Act. Um, there, We had two climate hearings in the Senate Agriculture Committee. Uh, the focus of the hearing yesterday was about research, but there was a really good um, a bit of conversation about regenerative, uh, regenerative agriculture and um, the role that the ag and food system can play in trying to help with climate solutions. Uh, so I think that that's something that you'll see continue and grow in focus going forward into the next Congress and in partnership with the administration. There's certainly lots of things that we can do um, hand in hand between Congress and the administration to try and uh, make a difference and really try to move the ball forward. And, you know, this is certainly an issue that uh, needs great attention and focus and has been stalled out in recent years. Uh, so I think that we're very excited about what the future holds for us being able to, um, to make a difference in the climate crisis as well. Yeah, I would just put a, a fine point on what Jacqueline said as it relates to um, climate change, the, the larger, broader debate and, and policy world in Washington, D.C. It's very contentious and has had a lot of 
uh, struggles in moving forward in any way, shape, or form. But I do think agriculture it brings together, um, you know, members that would not have a conversation about the broader conversation um, because it both is, is more evident and there's been progress in rural America around this um, that informs members that may be shut down in other areas. And so I do see opportunity there. Um, and I it is very evident from both what we've seen come out of the Biden administration and also in some conversations that I've had, how important and vital climate is as it moves across all issue areas for this administration. Um, so they will be making a big push. It's then how does that translate and what is the relationship with Congress um, and what can get passed um, um, you know, uh, in the next four years? All right, I have one last question, then we're going to get to any final comments or thoughts or statements. Or Yang, did you want to add something onto that? Oh, no, no, go, go. I I, I, I honestly was just going to say, just kind of echo what, what they both said, which is that obviously climate change or addressing climate change is, is a is a top priority of this incoming administration. And, you know, for our part, we've been having lots of meetings with you know, various stakeholders that are interested in, in this topic, including commodity groups. And we're hearing about all the various ideas as to how agriculture can play a role in that. So I think I think we're all kind of at the listening phase. There's so many ideas out there about what, you know, how agriculture can be impactful in this space. So we're, we're, we're open. And so for folks that are, the, for the person asked that question and for folks that are interested in 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 this in this broader topic of climate change and agriculture, I just encourage folks to just reiterating um, coming back and me, you know, talking to members and meeting with people like me and people like Jacqueline. So this is the we got several more questions, but we're going to take this is going to be the last one that we take. Um, so this is about the farm bill or other farm policy, but the question was pertaining to the farm bill. Does the farm bill in regards to land use um, take into account the needs of indigenous communities and the needs of black farmers who have historically, you know, have have harder time accessing funds or been, you know, disenfranchised from land? Um, does the farm bill take that into consideration or are there other bills that do? I think that's a that that's a that is a great question. Um, you know, does does the farm bill take into account? It's an interesting way of, of wording that question. <laughs> I, think, I think that you know the the far, You know, I I will I will say this on, on my boss's part. You know, we we would love to see that the farm bill play a greater role in addressing some of the issues, some of the land issues that are affecting Black farmers. There, there have been some provisions, and just most recently in the 18 farm bill around Ayers property that my boss. Um, championed um, somewhere around 60% of 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 uh, heirs of black land ownership is an heirs property, which is land that's passed on from generation to generation without without a deed. Um, so that has been a priority for sort of the the black farmer groups. There's there's some legislation that was recently introduced that is very robust um, in the Senate um, that I'm sure you know. Uh, Jacqueline has 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 seen and and I think there's a lot of interest in in this space. Um, we are again we're we're hopeful that um, that some of those some of those ideas uh, will will continue to to talk through um, and will potentially um, um, see some 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 jump offs from some of those ideas in the future farm bill. Yep, I would agree. I think the um, the there is a, a bill in the Senate that, that that has been introduced by Senator Booker, um, and it it is very robust and comprehensive. Uh, and I think um, we will have a lot of conversations going into the 2023 Farm Bill about um, what needs to be done in this space. Um, but in the interim, I would also say uh, there's a lot of work that can be done just with USDA, even in advance mm -hmm. of the next Farm Bill, to try and make sure that. Um, that some of the historical issues are um, remedied and that there are some opportunities to try and um, continue to improve the diversity and, um, and draw in a diverse group of farmers going forward, which I think is going to be really important uh, as we see an aging population, um, getting uh, as many people excited about farming and food systems as possible um, and making it easy for them to do so. And USDA welcoming environment is, um, is, is a good place to start um, as we look at the policies going forward for the next farm bill as well. So I want to kind of close this. You were, we're at time, but I want to take just a couple more minutes and hear briefly from each of you one thing that you're that you're most optimistic about 
looking into the food system of 2021? What are you what are you most optimistic about? Uh, we'll we'll start with Yang. We'll go Yang, Jacqueline, Trisha. How's that? I, you know, I, I'm optimistic that we'll continue to to work through solutions to address hunger during this pandemic. You know, I I, I really, you know, the farm bills and and transition reauthorization aside, I I think we've done a good job of coming together and coming up with some some pretty innovative ways to to make sure that you know low income families in particular. Uh, and senior populations have access to food assistance. So I'm I'm optimistic that that's going to continue, um, particularly now that we have a new administration coming in, now that we have um, a much stronger partner on the nutrition side. So very optimistic about that. Um, I'd, I'd agree. Uh, I think um, historically, food and nutrition issues have not been partisan. They've been bipartisan. Uh, we have a really good history on the Agriculture Committee of working together on nutrition and hunger issues. Um, even when we disagree, we come to agreement at the end of the day. And I think when we, you looked at the 2018 Farm Bill, uh, there was bipartisan consensus to protect nutrition programs. Uh, unfortunately, some of the challenges that we've seen in recent years were administratively driven, um, but Congress actually rejected some of the policies that we ended up seeing come to fruition as a part of um, administrative action. So um, I'm hopeful that some of the bipartisan spirit can continue in this space. Um, I think that, uh, as Yang mentioned, some of what we've been able to do on COVID is an example of um, folks coming together and being able to advance good policy to meet the needs of children and families in a crisis situation. Um, and I think that uh, I am very hopeful that we'll be able to do that in Congress and that we will have a good partnership with the new um, administration and the new USDA. Um, we do tend to love having USDA as a partner and work together on coming up with creative solutions. And I think that's going to be really important. Uh, I'm hopeful that there will be some good creativity and opportunities to um, continue to move uh food, farm, and nutrition policy forward in a positive direction that's about um, reaching people on the ground uh, in the way that they, they need um, it is, is so important. And I think we have a new opportunity to do some good. Trisha? And I, I am excited about holding um, and having access and helping build capacity at a USDA uh, for the first time in a very long time and doing it in partnership with our good friends um, uh, uh, on the Hill. Um, and in Congress, I think we've been shut down and they haven't had the capacity in a lot of respects to respond to the outside community, to the public, to the advocates. And so that to me is exciting that that, that process will begin again. Um, and I know there was a question at some point about how do you engage a new administration? And I'm available to have that conversation, <laughs> but I'm, that's what I'm excited about. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you so much, Trisha Griffin, Jacqueline Schneider, and Yang Garrison. Uh, thank you for joining us on this webinar. Thank you, those of you who attended. Again, uh, this is recorded. It'll be up by next week. If you'd like to share a link to it, uh, you can visit openforgood.com. I also want to do one last plug for saverestaurants.com um, for that Restaurants Act sign-on letter that'll go to congressional leadership. I encourage you to sign on to that. So restaurants, uh, saverestaurants.com. And you can always go to again openforgood.com we have we have a link to the sign on letter there as well and you can also access you'll be able to access this webinar you can see past webinars um, and find all sorts of really great useful resources and other information so please visit openforgood.com and we hope to see you at our next webinar thank you thank you, thank you.